It had been a late night at work. My feet dragged under me as I made my way to the subway station. I wondered to myself if all these late shifts were worth the paycheck. The pay was alright, and I never had to budget very much, but the back pain was beginning to catch up to me. I should really pick up some more Excedrin on my way home, I thought, forcing my feet down the stairs. What am I even doing anymore? I have no passion for my work. What happened to that childlike wonder I used to have? Wasn't I going to go somewhere in my life? I glanced at my phone. 11.13. I sighed. <sighs> Guess reality beat me into submission at some point along the way. What did I even want to do? Scanning my card, I made my way through the turnstiles, to where the subway would be meeting me in about 15 minutes. How did I forget what I wanted to do? Did I get too caught up in my work life? I had passion, ambition, that's why I started working here. I wanted to make enough money to do something, didn't I? Sitting down at a bench, I took a deep breath, pulling out my phone to check for any notifications. Two awaited me, both being random Facebook notifications from a group I'm in. As I opened the Facebook notification, I began to hear and feel a rumbling from the left side of the station. Checking the time showed 11.16. Guess they are early, I thought, putting my phone back in my pocket. A small gust of wind slapped me in the face as the train whizzed and began to slow. It took longer than usual to stop, but eventually, the last cart left in the station. I made my way to the train. The door opened as I approached, and as I got on, I glanced around. There were a few other people in there, all looking just to the side of me, as if they were trying to avoid eye contact. Guess the conductor's having an off day, huh? I chuckled, not receiving any response. A few seconds after the awkward silence, I made my way to an empty seat. I took a few more glances around, but everyone seemed to be doing their own thing, waiting for their stop. Another stop came. An older-looking bald man with a fedora got on, sitting next to me. A couple more stops came and went, the cart only seeming to gain more people. I had a few more stops before I could get off. At the next stop, the old man turned to me. I glanced over at him, noticing he was wearing a well-fitted charcoal suit. Can I help you? I asked politely. The man spoke, looking just to the right of me. I'm not sure you're on the right train. I got a little nervous, wondering if I really had accidentally gone to the wrong side of the station. Is this one not going south? No, it is. He chuckled. You just hopped on a little early, didn't you? The trains are never late here, you know. I let out a short snort. Okay, buddy. I turned back to my phone, waiting for my stop to come, then waited. Time kept on passing, but no more stops came. Before I could try to get up to call for the train to stop, my eyes grew heavy. I felt like I'd just been injected with 50 milligrams of melatonin. Before I knew it, I was out. The sun was shining in my eyes when I awoke. Nothing felt real. Standing up was a chore. I felt shaky. As I tried to focus my eyes, I found they wouldn't, not on what I was intending them to. I made my way to the door lightheaded, wondering if I'd caught something the day before. Stumbling out the door, I was greeted with an above-ground station midday. There seemed to be a lot of people getting off, but no one getting in. I was so disoriented, I couldn't tell where I was, but something wasn't right. I was sure of that. The boys didn't go above ground, did they? I practically fell down the platform, the lack of control in my legs making movement difficult. Careening my way to the sidewalk, a couple people asked me if I was feeling alright. Due to my lack of energy, I passed them by. I put all my effort in trying to focus on a street sign. Calden Avenue. Where's that supposed to be? I pulled out my phone, putting my hand over my eyes to block out the unrelenting blaze above. 8.17. I tried to do the math in my head to figure out how long I'd been out, but it was too much for my fogged mind. The world was a haze. What's going on with me? I thought, checking to see how many bars I had. Though it was hard to tell from the blur, it seemed I didn't have any service. I let out a shallow moan, putting away my phone. A few people looked in my direction, but quickly went back to what they were doing. After thirty or so minutes of waiting for a taxi, I decided stumbling my way to the nearest hospital would be my best shot. 
As time went on, it felt as though I was walking the same street on repeat. My head fog seemed to improve slowly over time, but the fever dream feeling persisted. After a couple of hours had passed, it began to get dark. Was I hallucinating now? It seemed real. I kept walking, trying to see if there was anywhere I could stay at the very least. As time passed, I soon came across an empty parking lot with a large sign. I looked up hazily. Hotel Grand. Glancing around, I didn't see any other buildings nearby. I was in the middle of some forest. Deciding I didn't have any other options, I headed for the entrance. Opening the door, I found a middle-aged man reading a newspaper, sitting at a desk. Walking over to him, I realized I couldn't tell what kind of paper he was reading, as if it were in another language. Focusing on the page, I could tell it was in English, but it was like my brain couldn't piece the letters together. Excuse me, sir. I'd like to rent out a room. The man glanced up, not putting his newspaper down. Another one of you, huh? Room 215 is open. He went back to reading. How much? What? I'm asking how much for the room. My fevered state being the only reason I wasn't growing agitated. He finally put the paper down. Look, kid. It's open. No charge. No key. Just go to room 215. Go to sleep, and everything will be fine. Disturb me again, and I'll throw your scrawny ass out. Deciding I'd rather not be thrown to the curb, I decided to head to the room. When I got there, I noticed there wasn't any sort of smell to the place, like it had been cleaned with pure neutral water, not even a hint of a cigarette, despite the overall shabby appearance of the room. Exhaustion overwhelming, I laid on the bed. I didn't even have time to pull a blanket over me before everything went dark. I didn't dream that night. I'm not entirely sure why, but when I woke up, I didn't feel much different. I was a little less exhausted, but the fevered sensation was still strong. Heading downstairs, I walked out the door. I thought I heard the man mumble something, but I couldn't bring myself to care. I felt as though I was gliding as I continued walking. I was unsure of where I was going, but moving was the only thing that kept me tethered to reality. Whenever I stopped, I'd feel myself begin to slip back into an unconscious state. The blurs that passed me by left me with mere impressions of what they could be. Eventually, I found myself at a small footbridge looking down. I saw there was a narrow creek underneath. Once I felt myself beginning to fade, I stepped onto the bridge. Making it to the other side, I found a pitch black horse standing a little ways away, staring at me. My slipping reality forced me to make my way to the horse. Reaching out a hand, it tilted its head back, avoiding my touch. What are you doing here? A voice overtook the area around me. I jumped back, nearly tripping over my numb legs. Nervous, I glanced around, trying to focus on anyone that might be around. Not seeing anyone, I approached the horse again, cautiously. You slipped out of your reality yesterday. You must find yourself again. I took a couple steps back, harp hitting my chest. What? What? The horse looked me directly in the eyes, opened its mouth. The mouth then split straight down the center. Each part of the mouth curled outward revealing a mouth of jagged teeth lining every inch of gums. I advise you find yourself again before you fade. The creature then turned and walked away. Turning around, I floated back the way I'd come. Everything seemed more distorted than before, though with time, I eventually found myself running into people again. Their faces seemed off, none of them looking quite real. Larger than normal eyes for some, displaced noses for others, some had no mouths whatsoever. Eventually, I found my subconscious leading me somewhere. I couldn't derail myself from wherever I was going. Time passed, and I ended up finding myself in front of a seemingly familiar home. Checking the door, I was thankful it was unlocked. As I entered, I heard people talking. Their words were indiscernible, but I was sure there were people somewhere. Heading to the out-of-focus kitchen, it sounded as though they may be downstairs. I walked around every room, trying to make out a stairway. Eventually, I found it. Through a doorway in the corner of the living room, I made my way downstairs. Their voices immediately became more audible, but all I could hear was gibberish. Not quite like they were speaking another language per se, more like I was no longer capable of understanding English. I knew their words should have been making sense, but it was like my brain couldn't connect each word to the other. I took each step down the winding stairs, my brain fog became far more unrelenting. I was in a haze, hardly able to process the limited visual information around me. Is there even a light here? 
I looked up as my feet glided down the winding steps. I knew there was light coming from somewhere, but it was as if the air itself was producing it. Finally, I reached the final step, and the voices stopped. I looked ahead of me to make out four figures. Aside from some vague details, they appeared to be mere silhouettes. Two of them were looking to my left, one to my right, and the last just above my head. Excuse me, I don't mean to interrupt. My body nearly gave out from under me. I'd begun to lose sensation in my body. I couldn't feel the feet in my shoes, the shirt I was wearing, nor the belt around my waist. All that existed in that moment was my dwindling consciousness. I... I don't mean to interrupt, but do I know you? The one looking to my right asked something, but I couldn't make out any words. A few moments passed, and a more stern-sounding statement came from the one looking above me. When the two looking to my left said something, they all began repeating the same sound. I knew I recognized them, but it was like they were chanting for me to leave. When one took a step toward me, I ran up the stairs as fast as I could. Once I made it out of the house, I clasped to the ground, deep panting until the smallest amount of focus returned to me. I was finally able to feel the shoes on my feet again. As I rose, a sudden shrieking began stabbing my eardrums. I held my hands over my ears before suddenly understanding what the shrieking was saying. I bolted as fast as I could, tripping a few times as I regained sensation in my legs. I had to run full speed. There was no avoiding it. As I pumped my arms, I began feeling the muscles and weight they carried. The head fog began to clear when I slipped turning a corner, creeping my right side up pretty bad. Refusing to fade, I got back up, pushing the pain into the back of my mind. There was no way I would let this vision, or afterlife, or whatever the hell it was, beat me. I refused to let myself go. I finally made it right as one last ungodly shriek sounded through the train station. I paused for a moment, panting before heading to the door, the door that had begun closing. I tried screaming to wait as I picked up speed again, but the train wasn't stopping. I ran full speed managing to get my fingers in the door, but I couldn't pry it open, and no one was on the train to help me. The train began to move, and I couldn't do anything. I tried pulling my fingers out at first, but that was just as ineffective as prying the thing open. Hey, help. Someone help. It isn't stopping and I'm stuck. But it was all for nothing. No one would even look in my direction. They all just continued with what they were doing as the train picked up more and more speed. Eventually, I collapsed, my fingers sliding down but still holding me in place as the concrete began skinning me alive. I screamed and shrieked for anyone to save me, but just like before, it was useless. There was no point, but the pain was just too much to bear, so I continued. Right as the train reached the threshold of the first tunnel, everything went dark. When I regained consciousness, I was on the train. I looked around and saw that this time, it was the train I took home. I patted myself down, feeling for anything out of the ordinary. My vision was back to normal, my head fog was gone. I didn't have any scrapes or anything. I let out a sigh of relief. The train began picking up speed again, and I decided to check my phone to see how much longer I had to get to my stop, but a cold sweat overtook me when I saw the time was only 11.30. I checked to make sure that the date was still the same. How could it have only been 14 minutes? How did I get on the train? What was going on? And as all those questions overtook me, a long since forgotten memory surfaced as I remembered who those people in the house were. They were the childhood friends I used to hang out with. A tear made its way down my face, signaling the initial cracks of a dam to burst. The ones I'd planned a future with, the people I'd promised I'd be friends with forever. The ones who went missing when I was 12. I'd made a promise as I cried over their disappearances back then, and I intend to keep it. I'm posting this here. Not for all of you, but for my family. So if I never make it back, they at least have a way of finding out why. We are not exactly on speaking terms, but if any of them happen to be reading this, I'm going to go find Emma, Connor, Olive, and Tyler. I know what I experienced was real. There's just no way a dream like that can fit into 14 minutes. I don't know what I experienced, but I think it was a sign. A sign that they are still out there and I just can't stand keeping at this dead-end life without them. This is Henry Yaler, signing off. You always liked the idea of camping, 
even though you never set foot in a tent before, let alone slept in a forest. Not the outdoors type, the opportunity never crossed your mind beyond a wistful interest spurred on by cheesy TV programs. But when your buddy offered to take you on a camping trip into the wild, boreal forests of Canada, you accepted immediately. Might as well give it a shot, you thought. Besides, your friend no doubt knew what he was doing. Why else would he ask you such a thing? So, after some planning and time, you packed your gear, hopped in the car, and drove hours out into an area not marked on any particular map. If only you had known what a grave mistake this trip was going to be. How long has it been? You are starting to panic, but know enough to keep it under control. It will be fine. Things obviously didn't go as planned with the camping, and your buddy definitely didn't have any idea what he was doing. So here you are, split up and lost. You both left the camping site lord knows how long ago, to go on a nice hike. At some point, your friend saw something interesting and disappeared into the woods as you were relieving yourself. Somehow, he managed to lose you, and now you've been wandering in a dozen different directions, praying you find your camp. How long will this go on? You'll have to find your stuff eventually, or maybe even the car. So you decide to keep at it, with your hopes high. It's been several days now. You know that. It's hard to tell with the dense forest and snow, but judging by the change in temperature each night, and the rotating sky dome, this wandering routine has lasted more than a couple days. The feeble snack bar brought along in your pocket is long gone. How oh, stupid to bring one granola bar and a canteen onto a hike in a freezing forest, you think to yourself. The canteen is nearly empty as well, but with all the snow around, this shouldn't be an issue. The food, however, is. Your hunger is growing, and you don't have the faintest idea how to hunt or gather in such a place. Even if you did, that would require tools, weapons, and traps. A list of items sadly missing from this scenario. If you are going to find your camp, it needs to be soon. The cold is starting to get bad. You found your friend, but truly wish you hadn't. His neck is broken, and he's long passed on. His body was just lying there, half buried in a snowdrift, at the bottom of a small cliff. He must have fallen down and hit his head or something. You don't want to think about it. The sight of his broken body is enough to shatter your control over your panic. If things were bad before, now they're horrific. You don't know what to do. He's gone forever, but you can't even process it. On top of the crippling grief, the cold and hunger are growing. Days have become a blur, and time is meaningless, as you stop paying attention to anything but the desperate hope of finding camp. Perhaps it would be best to rest a while here with your friend, out of respect, and to conserve energy. Well, now you feel terrible. You found camp. It wasn't even that far from his body, maybe 250 feet past the small cliff where he met his end. Even worse, while you have the supplies to get a little warmer, animals must have gotten to the food stores. There's nothing left. If you are going to find the car, it's going to have to be within the next day. With no working phone, no food, and little energy left, you are out of saving graces. Regardless, you need to get help. You need to get your friend out of there and to his family. This is my fault, after all. You think out loud. You should have never said yes to this damn trip. But now, another worry invades your mind. You have no idea where the car is. It's your friend's car, and you were passed out of sleep for most of the drive to where it was parked. The only thing for sure is wherever the car is, it's really, really far away. The two of you hiked at least two hours, changing directions multiple times to get from the car to the camp. At this point, you are way too cold and way too hungry to even retrace your steps to the car. While you are still panicking, you tell yourself you are not screwed. Not yet. It was stupid to think you'd ever find your way out of this. With your friend gone, the chance of finding the car is now close to nothing. How long has it been? You ask yourself, speaking out loud for the first time in a while. Unsure, your best guess is that it's been over a month at least. It feels like it's been. You're not sure how you're even still alive without eating for what? Maybe three weeks or something. It doesn't matter. So hungry. 
Honestly, if it wasn't for all the snow and the canister of lighter fluid you scavenged at camp, there's no way you'd have made it this far. If only animals hadn't gotten into the campsite food, damn them all. You realize the lighter fluid is starting to run dry. Time spent in your head is time wasted. Your hunger is getting maddening. Deciding to take a rest, you hike back to your friend. Being the first time returning to his body since you found him, you are repulsed to find that an animal must have gotten to him. Why did you even come back here, anyway? You should have just gone to camp. It's sickening. His body is in bad shape. You don't look for too long, as it makes you feel sick. Now, the worry of a lurking predator floods your mind for some reason. You convince yourself that since the animal left the body, it must be finished. Surely, it won't return. You've been sitting here for so long. There is no smell or noticeable decay. Just the damage from whatever got to your friend. The cold air is preserving the body well. All your food is gone, and you are so hungry. You are worried you will surely starve to death now. As you remember, a human can only go three weeks without food. All your energy is gone, and any hope of getting up to hunt is gone. Suddenly, an intrusive and morbid thought crosses your mind. Next to you is a perfectly good food source. Are you going to meet your end out here, like your friend? You know you want to live, and your hunger is driving you. You know what needs to be done. There is nothing. Nothing but hunger. Maddening hunger. Consuming hunger. No matter how much is eaten, the hunger grows. But you must keep eating. You need to keep eating. Lest the bad thoughts come again. The roaring torrent of chaos in your mind. Your body, it needs flesh. Your mind, it craves it. Though your body now appears gaunt and foul, your senses, strength, and mind are better than ever before. But you don't care. You just seek your next meal. And now, you found your way to civilization somehow. But you don't care. Freedom and safety are meaningless terms now. They are forfeit to the psychotic throes that await your hungering soul. All you care about is that. Your unending, insatiable hunger. So eat you must, and eat you will. I'm from Connecticut. I was in a long-distance relationship with a girl from Georgia, and would often make road trips down to visit her. I don't really mind. I love road trips. I've driven across the United States and back, all on my own. There's just something about traveling the highways of the US by yourself that's just so freeing. To save money, I would sleep in my car. It's not so bad. It's basically camping, in a metal tent. It makes you feel like you're really rough in it. I just recline the seat back, keep the key in the ignition, just in case, and doze off. No, I don't put anything up to block the windows for privacy. Maybe I should have. The trip down south is a comfortable two-day drive. My stop would usually be somewhere along the Virginia-North Carolina border. So, for my previous trip, that's exactly where I stopped that night. Rest stops were often less trafficked and thus quieter than truck stops. Normally, I would have stopped at a Love's, but I was just so tired that I settled for the first rest stop I saw. It was oddly vacant that night, with only a couple lone cars sitting forlorn under the amber street lamps most likely travelers with the same idea as myself. I pulled into a parking lot spot away from the others, under the shadow of a tree and far from the street lamps. I figured I would have more privacy there as opposed to being bathed in light. So I did my usual thing, locked my doors, opened the window just a hair for ventilation, kept my key in, reclined the seat, and went to sleep. I was never interrupted on any of these car camping nights, but I never suspected anything on this one. Then, a sharp tap woke me up. At first, I thought I had heard it in my dream. I opened my eyes, a bit confused. Since I was leaned back, I was facing the ceiling and couldn't see anything. I hear another tap, like a tiny object hitting a hard surface. It came in an irregular rhythm. Was it raining? Was water dripping on my windshield? I'm under a tree. Maybe something fell from the branches. Maybe a squirrel or a bird had dropped something. What if a squirrel was climbing around my car? Or what if it wasn't an animal? 
the thought occurred to me that it might very well be a person poking around outside. What did they want? Were the doors locked? Yes, the keys were in the ignition. I can leave in an instant. Still, I lay there, completely still, pretending to be asleep, pretending I hadn't heard anything, hoping whoever it was, they would leave me alone. It was better not to find out. I was too afraid to find out. It was better to stay here in blissful ignorance. Still, the tapping continued. I had to do something. There was no way I was just going to stay there. I had to look. My heart was pounding. In that moment, it was deafeningly loud. Whoever was out there could probably hear it. I decided I was going to look. I was going to raise my head up and see what was making the noise. So that's what I did. What met my eyes sent a jolt through my entire body. Every muscle fiber locked up in pure shock at what I saw. The faint glow of the street lamps cast just enough light for me to make out what I was looking at. There in the windshield, staring directly at me, was a face. Someone, I presumed to be a woman, was lying on my hood, her face pressed right up against my windshield. Her face was completely still, locked in a permanent grin. I froze in overwhelming terror. The eyes I stared into appeared to have rolled back, showing only the whites. The nose was turned up, pressed painfully into the glass. The lips stretched wide, revealing horrid, rotten teeth. Even in the darkness, I could tell her skin was sickly pale, contrasting her long, filthy black hair. Whoever this was, he was clearly not in her right mind. I don't know how long I sat there, too afraid to move. Finally, I got a grip on myself and shot my hand to the ignition. It turned over, making, in that instant, the most beautiful sound I ever heard. For a split second, I was afraid I might be caught in a horror movie scenario, the one where the car won't crank as the killer approaches. I reversed as fast as I could, trying not to give this creeper time to try anything. In my panic, I remember activating the windshield wipers in a futile attempt to get her off. I thought, was I about to drive out of here with some wacko holding onto my hood? Thankfully, I didn't have to worry about that, because as soon as I stopped, the woman leapt off, landing on all fours. Seeing my opportunity, I shifted into drive and gunned it, right as I saw her reaching for the driver's side door. With my foot on the gas, I sped out of the parking lot. Behind me, I heard her let out a piercing shriek like that of an animal. I looked in my rearview mirror, and for a split second, thought I saw her chasing me, running on all fours, her black hair swinging wildly around her. I couldn't get a good look, as I rounded a curve in the road, leading out of the rest stop and merged with the highway. There, I picked up speed, and drove through the night. I did not dare stop again, until I saw the morning light. Growing up, my grandpa always kept drapes over the mirrors in his house. I was a kid, and he had a big house. I assumed it was a fancy decoration. We moved before I was too old, and I kind of forgot about it. Once, when I was 15, he came to visit our house, and my mom had me help cover all of the mirrors in our house. Your grandfather has a phobia of mirrors, was all she said on the topic. I knew this was out of the ordinary now, and one night, while we were sitting in the living room together, I just blurted it out. Why are you afraid of mirrors? Oh, your mother probably wouldn't want me to tell you. It's not a nice story. Let's just say they remind me of your grandmother and leave it at that. Come on, I'm practically an adult. I can handle it. Well, okay, maybe. When your mom was just a kid, we found this mirror. My mom walked into the room and glared at him. You're not telling her that story, are you? He's too young to hear all of that. She handed us some ice cream, and my grandpa didn't budge again. I tried to get him or my mom to tell me for the following year or two. Every rejection added more intrigue to the story. The story is about your grandmother leaving us. It's painful for us to talk about. My mom offered once I had pestered her about it. I understood then why nobody wanted to talk about it, and over time I lost the desire to hear it. I almost forgot about it until this morning. My grandpa called me last week to tell me that he had a heart attack. He was okay in being discharged. I asked him if I could visit. This morning, I arrived to his house from the airport to find the familiar drapes drawn over the mirrors. My curiosity came back, but I couldn't ask an old man that had just had a heart attack to reminisce about the love of his life leaving him. 
I didn't have to ask. I never told you the story about the mirror, he said after we had finished catching up with each other and sitting in an awkward silence. I think now is as good a time as any. I might not have long left. They gave you a pacemaker, Grandpa. You'll be fine. I'm still 89 years old. I didn't have a reassuring response for that, so I just nodded. He started the story. We had just moved into our first real house after living in the basement apartment of my parents' house. Your mother was about six and really needed her own room. We bought an old house, too remote to be called the suburb, but I didn't mind the extra commute to give the family some breathing room. We were still considering having more children, and with our own house, it seemed possible. The place was a fixer-upper, but your grandmother had a knack for it. She repainted inside and out, fixed the lights, decorated, furnished the place beautifully, and even managed to fix the plumbing in one of the bathrooms on her own. There was an unfinished basement, and we got the idea in our heads to fix it up and turn it into an entertaining space. While we were preparing the space to start work and getting it inspected for asbestos, we found that one of the walls was built inside the foundation. It wasn't like a false wall, it was real, but it wasn't part of the original foundation, but we tore it down for the extra 10 foot or so of floor space. There was an antique mirror back there, one of those self-standing mirrors with a swivel, covered with a sheet. The thing must have been as old as the house, maybe older. We talked about having it appraised to see if it was worth anything, but decided to keep it as a talking piece. We finished the basement and set the mirror up as a decoration. At our celebration get-together, we realized there was something strange about the mirror. The reflections were off, like a funhouse mirror. One guy would be stretched too tall, another too short, and one of your grandmother's girlfriends had no face. It was kind of creepy, but kind of funny, a defective mirror. We kept using that space for weekend gatherings. Your grandmother would cook some hors d'oeuvres, and we'd have some drinks. The mirror was always a fun little attraction. This is where it gets... strange. I guess the mirror was contagious or something, because the other mirrors in the house started to play with reflection. Sometimes my hair would look fine, but when I started driving to work, I would notice it was a mess. One time, I saw two of me standing there. I got out of the house to go to work, at least. Your grandmother was constantly assaulted by the mirror. She would tell me she was obese, or that her hair was falling out and she looked the same she always had. I tried telling her she was just as beautiful as I had ever seen her, but when your own reflection is playing tricks on you, how can you believe that? She even told me one time that the mirror had tried to grab her and pull her in. I wrote it off as crazy. Our anniversary was coming up, so I came up with a plan to help bring the magic back. I got one of the neighbor girls to watch your mother, and took your grandmother out to dinner and dancing at a new restaurant. They had floor-to-ceiling mirrors throughout the place. When your grandmother saw her reflection in those mirrors, he sobbed. I thought I had messed up. Then she kissed me. Thank you, she said. Thank you. I haven't seen me in so long. This is how I always see you, baby, I said back. Sorry about the romantic stuff, but that night, that was the last time we were happy. It was amazing. Like when we had first met, my grandpa was crying now. I may have been too. Are you sure you want to keep going, grandpa? You need to know, he said. He wiped his eyes and began again. When we got home, the sitter was a wreck. She was screaming about how she and your mother were playing hide and seek, that your mother had been hiding without being found for three hours. You hear these horror stories of kids locking themselves in dryers and things. We panicked and split up to search the house, calling her name. Your grandmother went to search the basement, and after I had looked through your mother's room, I went down to check on her. She was sitting in front of the antique mirror, sobbing and screaming at it. Give me back my daughter. Please, take me instead. I was walking up to her and said, Baby, what's going on? And she said, She's in there. I see her. It took her. Give me back my daughter. I was almost to the point I could see the reflection, when the sitter yelled down the stairs that she had found your mother in her room hiding under the bed. I had checked under the bed, but that meant your mother had been running around actively avoiding us. I was pissed, especially seeing the state your grandmother was in over it. She was probably ten by then. She should have known better. We both ran upstairs and gave her a hug, but I told her she was grounded for a month and should know better not to make us worry like that. She just looked at her feet and apologized. 
After that, your grandmother became convinced that your mother had been replaced that night. She told me that your mother had started writing with her left hand instead of her right. There was a scar on her left ankle that had switched sides too. Finally, she told me she kept seeing our real daughter in the mirror in the basement, but she must have been replaced by something else. I talked to her about getting therapy, and she stopped talking to me about it. I thought maybe it had resolved on its own. I came home one day to your mother locked in her room while your grandmother pounded on the door with a kitchen knife in her hand. She was saying, Give me back my daughter, you shit. I tried to talk to her, but she lunged at me with the knife and accused me of being replaced too. I didn't know what to do, so I called 911. Killed me to do it. Your grandmother looked at me with this hurt expression, one I'll never forget, as I hung up the phone. She ran into the basement. I stood by the door to the basement until the cops showed up, but when we went downstairs, it was gone, just vanished. There was no other way out of the basement. The cops took my statement, and eventually we settled on the idea that she hadn't run into the basement, and I had mistaken which door she actually used in the heat of the moment. They never found her, but I started seeing her in the mirrors. First, just the one in the basement, then all throughout the house. We moved to another house, and it stopped for a bit then got worse. Even in the mirrors at work I saw her. I put these drapes up at home to get some peace. I've been doing it ever since. He stopped. My head was still catching up. Can anyone else see her? He laughed, stood up, and walked over to the curtain on the wall. You want to know if I'm just going mad. Let's see. He pulled the curtains and smiled sadly in the mirror. I couldn't see anything while seated, but I stood and froze. An elderly woman stood on the other side of the mirror, behind my grandfather's reflection. I had assumed he had PTSD or something. My mind was breaking. He pulled the curtains shut. You saw her? Not everyone can, he said. Am, am I going crazy? I asked. I've been asking myself that for years, sweetheart. Sometimes I think your grandmother may have been the same one. I finished my visit with him, somewhat stunned. I went to check in to my hotel. I am staying a few more days. Just before writing this post, my mom called me to see how my visit with my grandpa went. Talk about anything interesting? He asked. I couldn't answer. I would glanced at the mirror instinctively when she asked and saw my mother's reflection looking back at me. Hello? Did I lose you? He said. Not really. Just hospital stuff. Sorry, I got a text. I said, forcing myself back. After I got off the phone, I put a sheet over the mirror. I was on an assignment for the army, making my way up from San Antonio, Texas to Tacoma, Washington. It was a long drive, and they gave me six days to report to my new unit, but I didn't mind. I love road trips. There's nothing like the freedom of exploring the world by yourself. The first day of my journey, I planned to get as much driving in as possible, but could spend a few days in Utah, a sort of mini-vacation, you could say. This was January, and the days were short, so maximizing the amount of daylight I had was crucial. I got up extra early that morning, carried the last of my bags out to my Corolla, signed out of my old unit, and hit the road at roughly 5 a.m. It was an amazing day. I saw the landscape transform around me as I headed farther west than I had ever been in my life. From the San Antonio metropolitan area, to the savannas of the Edwards Plateau, to the pancake flat farmland of the Great Plains region, America's breadbasket. Finally, the farms opened up into a prairie, and I saw the Welcome to New Mexico, the Land of Enchantment sign. Now I was really in the middle of nowhere. Continuing on US Route 380, I eventually found myself in Roswell, I could have gotten a few more hours of driving in and made it to Albuquerque, but I figured since I was in no rush, I might as well see what Roswell had to offer. Who knows if I would get a chance to visit again. As a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious, as Mr. Ballin would say, I took a self-guided tour of the shops and attractions. The next day, I continued to Albuquerque, then westward on Interstate 40. By the time I reached Gallup and started northbound on US Route 491, I still had two hours of driving left before crossing the border into Colorado, and another 45 minutes before I would get to Cortez, my planned stop for the night. However, my daylight was already running out as sunset was at 6pm. 
I got Starbucks and refreshed myself for the final stretch. It was supposed to be easy, just a straight shot. But looking back on it now, I figured that, and I decided to stop in Albuquerque instead of Roswell the night previous, I would have already been in Colorado by now, and possibly be making my way into Utah. I would have saved myself from what was waiting for me on that desolate highway. Route 491 stretched far into the Navajo Nation. On either side of me were endless expanses of prairie, bookended by dark indigo mountains on the horizon. To my left, the sky glowed a faint orange-purple, the light slowly dying down like smoldering embers in a fire, until finally plunging the land into darkness. Every now and then, I would see the forlorn headlights of another car passing by, which gave me a bit of relief that I wasn't alone. I also had my road trip playlist on to keep me company, and call me ironic, but Hotel California was playing. After passing the small, lonely town of Newcomb, the next piece of civilization would be Shiprock. However, between the two was a 36-mile stretch of absolute nothingness, an abyss I had to cross. I was not ready for what I was about to witness. After several miles, and having not seen another car on the road, I saw something strange emerge from the horizon. Barely lit by the moonlight, I thought it was a road sign at first. Then, as I came closer, I realized it was a person, walking on the shoulder of the road, heading in my direction. I squinted, trying my hardest to focus on the figure. In the darkness, I could tell they were wearing a poncho of some sort, with long black hair flowing down past their chest. Who would be walking out here, all alone at night? I thought. Whoever it was, they had no lights, no reflectors, no strobes of any kind to signal to passing cars that they were there. And they walked on the pavement, dangerously close to oncoming traffic. I pulled to the left a bit, giving them a wide berth. Suddenly, my stereo cut out, as if I had turned it off. The screen went completely dark, and my phone disconnected from Bluetooth. While this was unusual, it certainly did happen from time to time, so I thought nothing of it. As I approached, I saw the person raise their right arm, as if to flag me down and hitch a ride. Oh no 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 no, I thought. There is no way that's happening, buddy. As my headlights swept by, I realized it was a man, dressed in a button-up shirt, a wool poncho, jeans, and cowboy boots. His large belt buckle glinted as the lights passed him, but in that split second, I realized with abject shock that not only were his eyes painfully wide open, but they seemed to be tracking me. Somehow, he was able to see through the glare of my headlights and look me dead in the eyes, not breaking contact until I passed. I was shaken for a bit, but my nerves gradually subsided. My stereo abruptly turned back on and my music continued playing. I brushed everything off as simply my imagination, the darkness and the shadows playing tricks on my mind. Besides, the man was behind me. I figured he must have been drunk. Indian reservations sadly had high rates of alcoholism. I looked in my rearview mirror. He was gone. I couldn't see him. Maybe he's too far behind me? No, that couldn't be. It must be too dark. Maybe. I drove on, trying to figure out what had just happened, but at the same time, forcing myself not to think about it. Just when I thought I had moved on, I saw another shape in the distance. Getting closer, I realized it was another figure. Another person walking alone at night? There's no way. They walked along the shoulder of the road, swaying back and forth. Slowly, I could make out that this person was also wearing a poncho. Then, I saw what looked like long black hair, reaching down past the chest. No, there's no way. It was the man. The same man. But how? The man raised his arm again, trying to flag me down. What did this guy want? I kept up my pace, with no intention of stopping for any reason. Just like last time, my stereo turned off again. Suddenly, the man leapt out into the road, arms waving frantically. I swerved into the left lane, narrowly avoiding him. In my headlights, I noticed he had the same wide-eyed look, his gaze locked onto mine. I also saw that his clothes did not look as they did the first encounter. Once, they were clean, if not well worn, but now they were soiled and tattered, rags barely hanging on to his withered frame. His hair was wild and unkempt, with clods of dried dirt stuck in the locks. 
but his eyes remained the same. My heart nearly burst through my chest at the sudden shock. Hyperventilating, I slowed down and glanced into the rearview mirror to make sure he was alright. Nothing could have prepared me for what I was about to see. The man was running. He was sprinting towards me. I centered the wheel and accelerated, hoping to get as much distance from him as possible. But as I continued to speed up, so did he. Faster and faster I drove, but every time I looked in the mirror, I would still see him right behind me, perfectly keeping pace, his body tinted red by my taillights. I could feel my temples throbbing and my hands getting slick with sweat from the steering wheel. I was sick to my stomach. There's no way. I looked forward, hoping to see a faint glimmer of light from the town ahead, but I was still too far away. I looked back at the rear view mirror. The man was gone. I should have been relieved, but I knew better. Where did he go? I looked around, hoping to regain a visual on him. I couldn't see anything. Taking a deep breath, I refocused on the road, but kept my guard up. Just keep driving, I told myself. Only a few more miles to go. Out of the corner of my right eye, I saw something. Another shape. It wasn't the man. At least, I didn't think so. I glanced over, bracing myself for whatever was going to meet my sight. It looked like an animal. Some kind of animal though I couldn't make out exactly what it was. Under the moonlight, I could see it running alongside my car, its forelimbs reaching out in long strides, its back undulating like a dog. Closer and closer it came. The closer it was, the more of it I could see, little by little. Then I noticed its limbs were far too long for its body. Its body was too short. It had no tail. The head was oddly round, and from it, came a trail of long, black hair. I slammed my foot on the gas, pushing my car's engine harder than it had ever been pushed before. By now, I was clocking well over 110 miles per hour, but this creature, it kept up. It wasn't phased. It simply ran faster and faster to match my speed. Just what was this thing? How could anyone or anything run this fast? The entity seemed to have endless stamina. Just how long could it keep this up? Just how much faster could it go? Soon, my car would hit its top speed. And then what? How long could it maintain that before breaking down? It wouldn't be long until my engine overheats. But regardless, I would eventually run out of gas. And when I do, what would happen if that thing got me? At 120 miles an hour, my car had reached its limit. This was the fastest I could go. But the creature continued its pursuit. My temperature gauge was approaching the red and so was my tachometer. I couldn't keep this up any longer. Suddenly, like the beacon of a lighthouse on a tumultuous sea, the first light of Shiprock came into view. It was so close. So close. If I could just go a little longer, I could make it into town. To safety. I pressed on. I fixed my eyes on the lights, growing brighter on the horizon. They bloomed outwards, glimmering in the night air. Though it was a small town, it was a sight for sore eyes in my situation. Looking in my periphery, I saw the undulation of the creature's spine as it kept up pace with my car. But now, it was slipping away, steering farther and farther from the road. It suddenly hit me just how hard my heart was beating. Beads of sweat dripped down my face. I looked over. The creature was gone. But this time, the feeling of dread had also gone with it. My stereo once again turned back on and as my music resumed, I breathed a deep sigh of relief. I let off the accelerator. The man, the creature, whatever it was, it was finally gone for good. Having white-knuckled the steering wheel the whole time without realizing it, my hands were extremely sore, but I was glad to have made it through. A week later, I told another soldier in my unit about what I had experienced. Being originally from Albuquerque, she was familiar with the Native American legends of the Southwest the conversation steered towards a certain creature that she would not dare speak the name of. She also told me that the highway I took was well known for all sorts of paranormal phenomena. Google what Route 491 used to be called, and everything will make sense. Be careful out there.